This is Pyramid Dynamics podcast number 35. And today we're talking about the effects of the Reynolds number on the aerodynamics of a wing. So this may seem a little bit strange, but the aerodynamics of a wing is dependent on the Reynolds number. And when you increase the Reynolds number, you do get a slightly different um, effect on the lift, drag, and the moment. So we're talking about that today. And to do so, we're going to look at a paper called Simulation Result Research on the Effect of Reynolds Number on the Aerodynamic Characteristics of High Lift Device. This is a paper. It's open access. You can see the link in the description if you want to play along at home. Otherwise, um, yeah, you can just listen to what I'm saying about this paper and what it goes into. So what they look into is obviously how they increase the Reynolds Number and how that affects their dynamics, but they look into the boundary layer and look at one particular airfoil called an NHLP 2D airfoil. So why is this airfoil important? It's fairly representative of a regular airfoil that you have on airplanes. It is a three element airfoil, which means that you have the main part of the wing and then you have something called a wing slat and a wing flap. So there are three elements to this wing and this is what we see in airplanes all the time. And when the boundary layer increases, the uh, when the Reynolds number increases, the boundary layer gets thinner, and you also get a change in lift, drag, and pitching moment. And we'll get into them after we've talked about why these things occur. So let's look at this airfoil now. As I mentioned earlier, it has three elements. Now the upstream part is called a slat, or sometimes called a Kruger flap. There are quite a few names for it. Like one thing that you find on airplanes is that there are a lot of air aerodynamic devices that um, are these, pretty much the exact same thing between different aircraft, but it, depending on who patented it and you know how they look, they call them different things. For example, on um, the most well-known example would probably be wing uh, wing tips and the uh, sharklets. So for Boeing, when you look at the wings, not the seven, not the uh, Dreamliner, the seven eight seven, but everything else before that, for like the last forty years including the 737, the 747. Uh, if you look at the wings, you have wing tips. So these, um, little hor- these little vertical things that come out at the ends of the wings. And these are to reduce the induced drag. And then also, uh, depending on how you design them, you can reduce the loading on the wings, and then it means that you can make the wings lighter. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> the Airbus equivalent is called sharklets. So they do the exact same job, but one's just called one thing, one's called the other thing, and it looks slightly different. But because one's patented, they come up with different names. So on a wing, you have typically a wing flap at the front, a wing slat, sorry, at the front, called a Kruger flap often. Then you have the bulk of the airfoil, and then you have the back, a wing flap. The reason why we have a three element airfoil is because you can dramatically increase the lift that this airfoil is producing if you incorporate these devices. If you just have the regular, the middle part, the big meaty bit, you can't uh, get as much lift. So what happens what, with these slats and flaps? When you want to increase the lift, so you can get up to like 2, 2.4 in the lift coefficient, when you want to get to that kind of range, you push the wing slat at the front forward and down, and you push the wing flap at the back backwards and down. So that dramatically increases the camber of the wing. Now, you, you can't usually do this. You can't If you get a regular wing and you make it um, the exact same camber and thickness but just the one element instead of three elements, you will typically get flow separation. The reason why this doesn't happen on this type of air, uh, air foil is because between each of these elements, you have a small gap. And in this gap, you can get air bleeding through and going over the rest of the airfoil. So what this means is instead of having just all this slow flow on top, you can then re-energize the flow at certain points, strategic points, and keep the flow attached. If you don't do that, then by the time you get to like halfway across the airfoil, for example, the air, the boundary layer has just lost so much velocity, so much steam that from the adverse pressure gradient that it will just detach. So by having this three element airfoil, you can greatly um, delay flow separation, which means that you can greatly increase the lift that you produce. And one thing that we should note is that the effects of the Reynolds number on this airfoil is typical of all airfoils. Like the general typical airfoil that you'll get at random it will display the same kind of uh, same kind of results with the Reynolds number increasing. So it's fine to look into this one. So what they did was they um, did some CFD on it and they looked at 
the boundary layer. So they looked at the influence of the boundary layer but the neurons on the boundary layer. And what they say is that it can be seen as as the Reynolds number increases, the thickness of the entire boundary layer gradually decreases, and the strength of the wake decreases as the Reynolds number increases. So this is a very important point. There's quite a lot in this sentence, so let's break it down. First of all, they say, as the Reynolds number increases, the thickness of the entire boundary layer decreases. So why is that? Well, for those of you who are um, who know about boundary layers, who have studied them, um, we know that a laminar boundary layer is significantly different from a turbulent boundary layer, mainly in its profile. So if you look at a laminar boundary layer, when you go fairly close to the wall, the velocity is still fairly slow. So if you were to plot the velocity as you get away from the wall, it's a fairly gradual increase. When you have a turbulent boundary layer, this, this um, increase is much more dramatic. It's, it's much sharper. So that's why we're getting a smaller boundary layer because the Reynolds number is higher, the flow is more turbulent, we get a, a smaller boundary layer, a thinner boundary layer. That's great. Now, in this, the next part of the sentence, they say that the strength of the wake decreases as the Reynolds number increases as well. Now, the reason for that is twofold. One, if you increase the Reynolds number, the boundary layer has more momentum, and that means that you can resist the adverse pressure gradient longer, which means you have a smaller wake just by default. You, you know, the, the flow is attached longer. What's more, if you have a smaller boundary layer as well, which is what they mentioned when you increase the Reynolds number, the boundary layer reduces in, in size. That's also going to reduce the wake because when you think about it, the boundary layer actually does create a wake because even if you look at the wake of a highly streamlined uh, object like an airfoil, symmetric airfoil at zero degrees angle of attack, you still do get a wake and that's because of the boundary layer. So the flow can be completely attached, but the boundary layer's presence means that you're still going to get a wake. So reducing the thickness of the boundary layer reduces the wake. And it also, if you when you increase the Reynolds number, it also um, allows the boundary layer to stay attached longer, which means that you get a reduced wake that way as well. So that's one major effect that the Reynolds number has on the boundary layer and on the airfoil in general. So that's quite interesting to note. What's more, they then talk about the influence of the Reynolds number on the aerodynamic coefficients. So what they have are some figures, figure 12, for those of you playing at home. There's the lift coefficient, drag coefficient, and the moment coefficient uh, plotted uh, with the Reynolds number on the x-axis. Interestingly, they have two different angles of attack, 4.01 degrees and 20.18 degrees. I don't know why they picked these two particular uh, angles of attack. I mean, 20.18, I don't know why this went with 20 or 21. But anyway, a mystery of um, that we'll uncover maybe later. <laughs> So anyway, what they notice for the lift coefficient is as the for the higher angle of attack, when you increase the Reynolds number, the lift coefficient increases significantly. So when you have a Reynolds number of um, what's that? Probably about one million, maybe. The lift coefficient is about three point eight five, maybe three point eight. When you've gone all the way up to thirty million, it's now above four. So it's about a ten percent increase. And the reason why that is, is because um, of the stall characteristics. When you have an airfoil, particularly a thick airfoil, the way that a thick airfoil um, that separates, it starts stalling from the trailing edge and then moves upwards. So let's say at 14 degrees angle of attack, you start getting a little bit of flow separation. That's going to start at the trailing edge. Then when you bump it up to, let's say, 15 degrees, that separation is now going to move uh, march forward. So you might have now 15% of the cord of the airfoil um, separated. When you bump it up to 20 degrees, you might have 80% of the airfoil um, separated and only the, the leading edge is now really attached. That's how a thick airfoil stalls. So that's why when you go to a very high angle attack, like 20 degrees is quite high for a, an airliner, uh, which is what this type of wing is for. Increasing the Reynolds number dramatically reduces the um, stall because the flow is still staying attached. The reason why that is is because the boundary layer is more turbulent, has more energy, which means that it can resist the adverse pressure gradient for longer, for higher angles of attack, and stay attached, and you're producing more lift. Contrasting that with a 4 degree angle of attack, the lift coefficient still does increase slightly with Reynolds number, but not that much. 
it's not it's not 10 percent like the other one at 20 degrees now the reason why it does increase a little bit is likely due just to the boundary layer thickness as i said it's getting thinner it's getting faster near the surface so you're gonna get benefits from that that's just the coefficient now we can move on to the drag coefficient the at 20 degrees when you increase the Reynolds number from 1 million to 30 million the drag coefficient drops dramatically it goes from 0 0.09 which is quite high to 0 0.65 about so that's very low now or not very low but it's significantly low it's like 30 percent less why is that again due to the stall so as you increase the Reynolds number you're reducing the amount of stall and then that means you reduce the, the drag coefficient because um, during stall the majority of the drag produced is due to the pressure drag you have a much um, greater pressure behind which then um, sorry you have much greater pressure ahead and then lower pressure behind which then creates this backwards force so by keeping the flow attached longer you reduce this interestingly at four degrees angle attack you still reduce the drag but that's again due to the boundary layer being thinner and faster so you have a smaller wake anytime you can reduce the wake size it's almost uh, guaranteed in in aerodynamics in it, at least aeronautical engineering to reduce the drag now one thing we should note is when you increase the boundary layer speed so the velocity of the flow near the wall you are going to increase the friction drag but because the friction drag is, does not compromise nearly the majority of the drag it's like maybe 10 percent at this stage maybe even less the small increase that you get in friction drag is greatly eclipsed by the reduction in pressure drag so overall we get a massive reduction in drag another thing that we should talk about is the induced drag so the induced drag it's the quintessential vortex that you see at the wing tip and even though there are um there are um, flow control devices that do get that do re greatly reduce this like the wing tips that we mentioned earlier there is always still going to be a little bit of induced drag and if you increase the um, lift production as we are getting here naturally you will increase the induced drag a little bit as well the the upside is that again during the stall angle attack the pressure drag is almost always going to be the dominant uh, component of drag so if you can reduce that you always reduce drag even if you do get uh, small increases in the friction and induced drag they're eclipsed now for the moment coefficient which is also important for the aircraft stability the moment coefficient becomes even more negative as you increase the Reynolds number both for both angles of attack so this is generally generally favorable it can um, depending how you increase depending how you design your aircraft I guess it will increase your longitudinal stability which is always a good thing for aircraft that are designed just for transport and passengers when you're looking at maneuverability that's maybe not such a good thing that's a, a different story before we go any further i just want to say to check out earth interpreters check out the instrumentation we do we do courses for theory cfd and experience so if you want to learn more like what you're doing now check them out we do instrumentation so we do piv we do traverses and we do the atmosphere hawk the atmosphere hawk is one of our inventions it actually measures the density of air which is very important when you're doing a wind tunnel measurements, not just for your for your data, but also if you want to use that data for CFD validation. The reason why is because if you're if you think that in your wind tunnel you have a certain density, let's say it's 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, but on the day it's actually 1.22, then when you go to your CFD, you're operating with the wrong with the wrong density. So you're going to get wrong flow physics and wrong um, forces. That means that validating your CFD model is near on impossible. At the very least, you're not going to get a good validation. So you need to really keep track of your density. The Atmosphere Hawk helps you do that. So check that out. Links in the description. And we also have the International Aerospace Conference every year. Check that as well. So let's move on with the effects of the Reynolds number on the lift coefficient of an air airfoil. We have now a figure and it plots on here the angles of attack from zero to to 29 no 28 degrees sorry and the lift coefficient on the y-axis and has all the the Reynolds numbers plotted here and again what we're seeing is the major effect of the Reynolds number is seen at high angles of attack at low angles of attack pre-stall angles of attack 
there is a, a difference. There is an increase in the lift slightly as you increase the Reynolds number. And that's again due to the boundary layer being a bit faster and slightly lower wake and etc. But once you get to the stall angle attack, then that's where the magic of the Reynolds number really comes in. So when you increase the Reynolds number, the flow stays attached longer and that way you can delay stall. Now, one thing that I want to talk about is the term of intensity. So I mentioned in a couple of podcasts ago how the term of intensity, actually podcast number 32, I believe, where we talk about wind tunnels and, and even 31, sorry, 33 and 32. We're talking about wind tunnels. The term of intensity, we're talking about that there. If you want to learn more, check those out. But the term of intensity and the Reynolds number are highly coupled in a sense where the Reynolds number can dictate whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, but so can the term of intensity. So the term of intensity is how chaotic the flow is, how, how much the flow's velocity deviates around the mean velocity. Again, if you want to learn more, check out those other podcasts, 32 and 33. So even though you have a certain Reynolds number, if you change the term of intensity, you can mimic the effects of increasing the Reynolds number just through that. If you go from, let's say, term of intensity of 0.5% to 2%, you can mimic the effects of increasing the Reynolds number dramatically. And then you can also get that um, benefit in the lift. So that's the end of the podcast. We explained the effects of the Reynolds number on the and drag and moment coefficients of an F wheel. And we found that overall they're significantly beneficial increasing the Reynolds number. You get a higher lift, lower drag, and better lift, moment coefficient. So make sure to like and subscribe this. Check out Earth and Max, check out the instrumentation we do, check out the courses we put on, and check out the comments we put on every year. See you in the next podcast. Peace out.